So tell me, Neil, is the Earth flat? We have video from space of the rotating spherical Earth. The Earth is round. Thank you for joining us on this episode. Just like NASA's other spokesperson, Michelle Thaler, whose top globe proofs I debunked in my previous video, Neil deGrasse Tyson's first go-to answer when asked for scientific evidence that Earth is a spinning ball says, we know because pictures. You mean pictures like these, Neil? Pictures like these? And we have video from space of the rotating spherical Earth, he says. You mean videos like these, Neil? Well, I know you already know this, but pictures and videos like these obvious CGIs can be and are faked, and neither of those are permissible as scientific evidence. What's, what's odd is there are people who think Earth is flat, right. but recognize that the Moon is round, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and the Sun are all spheres, but Earth is flat. That's not, something doesn't square. Something doesn't jive, right? Okay. So like a magician who distracts you with one hand while fooling you with the other, Neil commits what I call the appeal to the sky fallacy, claiming to provide scientific proof for the shape of the earth under our feet by looking at a light in the sky. That's right. When you ask scientists for empirical measurable proof of the shape of the earth beneath our feet, they invariably, inevitably turn their noses up to the sky and start talking about the shape of things up there. Imagine inviting a contractor over to your house to measure the dimensions of your floor, and he immediately gets out his tape measure and starts measuring all the recessed lights in the ceiling. So if you want to say Earth is flat, then, for example, lunar eclipses. What's a lunar eclipse? If your face is the brilliant sun. Thank you. <laughs> and this is Earth, mm -hmm. and the moon is over here. The sun is always casting Earth's shadow into space. It's always there no matter what. Right. So the moon occasionally passes through that shadow. And if you see the shape of Earth's shadow on the moon, it is always round. Always round. If Earth were flat, sometimes you get like a flat shadow. Right. And we've never seen a flat shadow. Right. To this day, heliocentrists still offer this argument as proof of a spherical Earth, claiming that during lunar eclipses, the sun, Earth, and moon align in a perfect 180-degree syzygy like three billiard balls, causing the sun to cast the Earth's shadow onto the moon. This clever but faulty assumption is rendered completely invalid, however, due to the fact that lunar eclipses have happened and continue to happen regularly when both the sun and moon are still visible together above the horizon. As early as the time of Pliny the Elder, there are records of eclipses happening while both the sun and moon were visible in the sky and continue to be recorded by the Royal Astronomical Society today. Obviously, if the sun and moon are both observable simultaneously during an eclipse, then they are not aligned in a 180-degree syzygy, and it is therefore impossible that the sun could be casting Earth's shadow on the moon, and some other explanation must be sought. Another explanation, in fact, already existed in many cultures around the world, who posited that a third celestial body, known as Rahu, or the Black Sun, also existed equal in size to the sun and moon. This translucent dark body passed affront the sun and moon during eclipses, causing their lights to dim. But regardless of what causes the moon's lights to dim during lunar eclipses, it has absolutely nothing to do with offering scientific proof of the shape of the Earth. There's a famous experiment conducted by Eratosthenes. Tosthenes. Eratosthenes. Tosthenes. And the two cities in the old world, mm -hmm. and one of them, they knew that at 12 noon on a particular day of the year, that the sun was directly overhead, and you can see the bottom of a well. Oh, okay. How can we use this observation to see if Earth's surface is curved? We needed another well. Turns out we can't see the bottom of both wells at the same time. What might explain this? Well, there are two possible explanations. First, we could have a flat Earth with a sun that's small and close by, so that the light hits the second well at an angle. Or second, we could have a curved Earth with a sun that's big and far away, so that all the light comes in parallel, but only one well at a time is lit all the way to the bottom. For his next supposed proof, Neil brings up Eratosthenes, who noted that at noon during the summer solstice in Seine, the sun cast no shadow and the rays could reach straight to the bottom of his well. Yet meanwhile, in Alexandria, a vertically standing metal rod cast a significant shadow. 
By factoring the length of the shadow with his assumed distance to the sun, Eratosthenes recorded a measurement of Earth's circumference close to what heliocentrist astronomers still use today. The fact of the matter is, however, that Eratosthenes' calculations were made assuming the sun to be millions of miles away, so that its rays would fall perfectly parallel, even in points as divergent as Cyan and Alexandria. This faulty assumed premise led to his faulty conclusion, which was eventually exposed upon the invention of the nautical sextant. Using sextants and plane trigonometry, by measuring the sun's angle at two points on Earth simultaneously and factoring their distance from each other, the Pythagorean theorem reveals both the height and dimensions of the sun. Using this method, the sun and moon have repeatedly been calculated to be approximately 32 miles in diameter, 3,000 miles from the surface of the Earth. High-altitude balloon footage has also filmed lighting hotspots on clouds proving the sun to be local and acting as a spotlight and not a burning ball of gas millions of miles away, as supposed by heliocentrists. After Eratosthenes, the globe-earth theory completely disappeared from philosophical thought and recorded history for almost two millennia. Geocentric flat-earth cosmologies continued to reign supreme, with even Eratosthenes himself, touted as the father of geography, depicting the earth as flat in his famous 194 BC map of the world. So one last thing, which should be obvious, okay. if you pay attention and think about it. If you send a ship straight to the horizon, right. eventually it begins to disappear until it's no longer visible beyond your horizon. Right. And you should ask yourself, what kind of surface would produce that result? Um, the ocean, if, it, if it's con... The ocean has a ramp. <laughs> <laughs> Seafarers knew this. Right. And so what, however flat they would have imagined the Earth to be, they, they, couldn't, have, they couldn't have accepted it to be completely flat, because otherwise you would never not see the ship. Okay. His next argument just like the previous two, comes from ancient Greek philosophers who have been debunked since the time they were presented even way back then. The fact that NASA's top modern globe proofs are still simply regurgitating long-refuted claims from over 2,000 years ago should raise some suspicion. The fact of the matter is that the law of perspective on plane surfaces dictates and necessitates this occurrence. For example, a girl wearing a dress walking away towards the horizon will appear to sink into the earth the farther away she walks. Her feet will disappear from view first, and the distance between the ground and the bottom of her dress will gradually diminish until after about half a mile it seems like her dress is touching the ground as she walks on invisible legs. The same happens with cars speeding away. The axles gradually get lower, and the wheels vanish until it appears as if the car is gliding along its body. Such is the case on plane surfaces. The lowest parts of objects receding from a given point of observation necessarily disappear before the highest. Now, with modern telescopes and cameras, we can prove this as well by successfully zooming in on ships that have gone beyond the horizon and bringing them completely back into full view, hull and all. Also, if I just tell you, Chuck, walk due east, okay? Right. And don't ever stop. Right. I just turn around my chair and face this way, and eventually you're going to come back. Right. And you'll probably be about 150 <laughs> years old. I am no Forrest Gump. That is how long it would take me <laughs> to run the earth. There is a popular myth taught to school children, which most adults today still believe, that people in history have traveled in perfectly straight lines eastwards or westwards, and eventually arrived back at their starting point. It is heralded as proof of the globe Earth, and claimed that hundreds of adventurers since Magellan have completed such successful circumnavigations, but the truth is that no one in history has ever set off traveling in a perfectly straight line and returned back at their starting point. All successful circumnavigations in history, whether by sea or air, have instead followed the same pattern, which is sailing or flying the most convenient route from port to port, stopping for supplies and refueling until a complete circle has been made. Not a single sailor or aviator in history has or could travel only in the same one perfectly straight direction and magically arrive back where they began. 
This ridiculous lie becomes obvious when critically examined, but when taught to young children, successfully bends and warps their minds into accepting globe indoctrination. Unlike the cardinal directions on a compass rose, north, south, east, and west on earth are not simply straight lines separated by 90 degrees. North, rather than being an upward shooting arrow, is actually a point, a center point, the center point of the entire Earth, known as the geographic North Pole, situated directly below Polaris, the North Pole Star, the only motionless star in the heavens which marks the exact northern center point of the sky. South, rather than being a downward shooting arrow, is actually every line tangent to the northern center point, or in other words, every straight line extending outwards from the North Pole, heads due south. East and west, rather than being right and left facing arrows, are actually clockwise and counterclockwise circles around the pole. The sun, moon, and stars all rise in the east and set in the west, making perfect circles over and around us every day. As you can observe, they travel in a circular westward path over and around the earth, and do not all travel in a straight leftward direction as suggested by a compass rose. Likewise, navigators since ancient times have used Polaris to guide their ships, knowing that Polaris was the heavenly North Pole, south was traveling keeping your back to Polaris, east meant traveling keeping your left shoulder 90 degrees to the pole star, and west meant traveling keeping your right shoulder 90 degrees to the pole star. All circumnavigations in history have been eastwards or westwards, and never northwards or southwards, because the latter is geographically impossible. For me, the fact that there's a rise of flat earthers is evidence of two things. Okay, one. One, we live in a country that protects free speech. That's actually kind of awesome. And two, uh -huh. we live in a country with a failed educational system. Ooh, that one hurt. If there's one thing Neil and I agree on, it is that our public education system is indeed a complete failure brainwashing vulnerable, impressionable young children with mentally and spiritually damaging pseudoscientific indoctrination. The widespread belief that humans are merely evolved apes clinging to a spinning space ball hurtling around the sun is proof of this. The modern rise of the geocentric level earth cosmology is a direct response and reaction to humanity finally collectively waking up to countless centuries of uncontested lies and propaganda.